Hi, this is Mary Bukovalis from What's My Scene magazine, and today I'm joined by Mick Thomas, legendary Mick Thomas. Hey, Mick, how are you going? Not too bad yourself. I'm good, thanks. Thanks so much for your time. That's all um, right. That's all right. Good to be here. And you're just released a new single. How did that come yeah. about, and how do you feel um, about it? I feel pretty good about it. Like the, you know, I can't think of a record that's sort of come together so as um, organically as this one has. You know, and that's in the 35 years that I've been sort of doing it and releasing records. But it just, you know, it was just a thought and an idea, and it just sort of, you know, it, it, yeah, it wasn't like the, it wasn't without its obstacles. But um, just every kind of you know idea we had seemed to just take it one forward, one further step. So yeah, it was. You know, let's do this, let's do that. Yeah, let's make a record. All right, let's do, you know, and all of a sudden the record was out. I've just never, uh, you know, just in from, you know, gestation, which you'd say w when you started writing the songs to th an album coming out, it, it's certainly the quickest thing I've ever done, yeah. uh, which is, was really satisfying in some ways because so many records that you bring out, you sit on them, you know, for ages that, you know, they sit there at home and you, and, you know, you can get all sorts of doubts about them and start mm. second guessing. And, you know, I, I just kind of see second guessing as, you know, the absolute, the arch enemy really of, of art. You know, I reckon you just yeah. got to go with your feeling and just go with it. And um, we sure did that with this record. And, and so even though it's not like a big record, it this basically has been three singles off it you know so which is kind of yeah. kind of amazing you know like she was a single before the album was even conceived yes. and then that went on the album and then the big track uh, see you when i'm looking at you obviously became a single and did really well and got a lot of attention and then you know um dave lang has been driving a lot of this stuff a publicist he's just been really good at you know having ideas and you know i mean i've i've had various um managerial set setups in the you know, uh, over the over the journey, and um, uh, the last few years I've been self managed, and mm. it's been okay. You know, I mean, you sort of get used to it. You know, I mean, I, I don't know whether I'm unmanageable. You know, like <laughs> I seem to just go, I seem to go through them, and uh, <laughs> you know, um, and sometimes you know I consider out wondering why that is, but most of the time I just kind of dust myself off and you know, go again really with someone, but to have Dave involved, he's been, you know, he, he sort of approached me um, again, you know, around the time of the first lockdown and said yes. he was going out on his own as a publicist. And I've sort of worked with him in various guises over the years, you know, and I said, yeah, well, you know, I think that with publicists, there's nothing like, um, nothing like a hungry publicist, you know, someone who's sick, he's setting up his own business. And so he's really gone hard and he just keeps yeah. sort of, having ideas and he sort of drove the album in a lot of ways. He said, what is this? This is an album. You he heard, he heard two or three of the tracks. And so same with, um, I heard Sally sing and he said, look, and it was the song that was probably getting almost the least attention on the record of, mm. of the whole thing. But he said, look, it's a really good song. And it really is kind of the key to it in a lot of ways. It's, you know, about, you know, thinking about where we are and where we were and what we've lost. And, and he said, well, why don't you do a cheap film clip? Just, just something to get it out there. And, uh, you know, so I've, I've sort of taken his lead a fair bit on, on a lot of this stuff. And, you know, I, I don't need much encouragement to do stuff, you know, but you need yeah. some, some, some encouragement. And especially with things in lockdown, you know, you're not really hanging out with your band, you know, not that we kind of, mm. not that we hang out really. We're old, you know, when we go off to it, because we, we still tour, Especially in the early days of the weddings, yeah, you woke up every day, you were in that band. That's yeah. what that was the first thing you used to say was, mm, I'm in the weddings. What am I gonna do today? You know? What are we like for a while there I was, you know, living with various band members and you know, you just get up and this is even before we started touring properly, but we just get up and just record all day and just demo yeah. stuff. And, you know, it was really, you were really aware that that was a defining thing in your life. Whereas mm -hmm. when you get older, it's not so much the case, you know, you're, you're not sitting around discussing what you're going to do or what you might be able to do. But How does it feel recording something that is quite a sad moment? Um, again, it was, it was just so, um, so organic. Like I, I, I got an email from Felicity Urquhart, who does the ABC um, country show, yep. That's, which is just a digital thing now. Um, and she said, oh, has anyone got any songs? She's, I'm starting a new you know, section on her show. Has anyone got any songs they've been working on that they want to do some, you know, with this preview, talk about them. And I said, and I was just sort of 
pretty much halfway through it and I, and I, I really love the city and I, I sort of got me in touch and I said, yeah, I've got something I'm working on. I'll, I'll see what you reckon. And so I, um, I just sort of finished it off that afternoon and recorded it straight away. And I thought, ah, oh, Ben Franz, who plays bass with us, he was, um, he's in Perth with his mum um, for this whole thing. And uh, I sent it over to him and he put some um, pedal steel on it. And so I gave it to Felicity and he did that afternoon. I gave it to Felicity that night and sort of explained it a bit. And um, she really loved it and she played it. And then, then, you know, Ben sent it back and then I, I got Brooke Russell to sing on it. And, Beautiful. you know, that was, that was kind of the start of the album in a, in a, in a lot of ways. But it, before I knew it, the song had sort of been aired nationally. And then I did Delivered Live um, in that first season they did. And, um, I opened with it that night and I was just, so it just sort of found its place pretty quickly, you know, so yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't too much um, plotting or planning or conscious thinking about, you know, where it was going to go or what it was going to be, you know, and uh, I, it was, I was certainly well down the track with it before I thought I just should check with Selkin here back from her and I thought, uh, you yeah, know, well, yeah, you know, if she really objected, she would have said something, but Sal's nature, she's pretty laconic and uh, I don't think she checks her emails that much and, <laughs> She finally got back to me and she was wrapped and she emailed me yesterday morning and just said, oh, Mick, I'm, she said, I'm actually blushing, you know, yeah. when, I, when she watches the film clip. And I said, well, you know, from my perspective, if, if I could be in film clips where I don't actually have to, you know, go and stand in front of a camera, I would consider that a win. <laughs> <laughs> they sort of rang me up about it and I just started talking, and they started talking about <clears throat> corner hotel moments, you know, things that happened there. And I sort of remembered, yeah, half a dozen things, but I, you know, do, but I was kind of go back to that, the night of the, um, I think it was the 97 grand final, you know, yeah. like, I'm, and I remember Peter Hayes, he used to manage the weddings. He's a big St Kilda supporter. And, um, and so he made sure that, and he, and he's, he's um, a guy that comes to rock and roll via racing. So he's kind of like a punter, you know. And yeah. I remember he came to me about halfway through the season. He said, "He said I got a got a good feeling, Mick. He said I reckon <laughs> we're going to make it through." He said, I'm, "And he said I'm going to book the corner <laughs> and final night." And uh, and he and he and he booked. I wished I had it wound into the song because it's uh, he booked the Wild Pumpkins at midnight, second on the bill, and Barb Waters uh, and the Rough <laughs> Diamonds. So, so he booked three bands that had lead singers who were St Kilda supporters, and, yeah. and like he had every good place, and then they bloody turned around and lost. And I just remember walking in that night, and it was just this gut wrenching night, and people were really upset. And uh, Richie Ludbrook, who's one of the co-owners of the Corner, and he owns half a dozen other bars around the place. And I remember he sort of, um, you know broken burst into the band room and he just went up to me and he said thomas he goes you know he says everyone's pissed off everyone's upset they don't need you to bring them down they don't want you bringing them down said, there he goes and just play the gig of your life you know and uh, so uh, that night will always sort of stay with me but you know there's a uh, there was 10 other things i could have probably put in the song easy you know joe strummer being probably the one who was uh, oh, announced for blues fest as well that's brilliant yeah. Um, and you do star in Stuart Coop's book for a little bit too, right at the start when he's talking right. about Paul Kelly. Yeah, look, I, you know, I'm the first to admit that, you know, Paul's been a real, you know, I think influence is the wrong word. He was sort of a mentor. He's just been yeah. a big help, you know, like over the years. And, you know, there's a, a few times, you know, people have sort of suggested, I, I know Stuart sort of asked me about, you know, how I felt about the whole, the ascendancy of Paul and how he's become this sort of dominant songwriter. I said, well, you know, it sort of shits me that I live in a country where you can't seem to have find room for anything but one singer songwriter. Yeah. But I said, Jesus, if you had to have one, you might as well have a good one, you know, and, yes. and, he's really good. and just how his output's just been fantastic. And, and I reckon the other inspiring thing about Paul is that his most successful records have been his last couple. You know, is it? You know, he's he's run his career really well, and you know, and I know that he battles the same things that I do. That when he goes out on tour, people want to hear the old songs and these mm. old favourites that are very much part of their lives. But it's only because they're fucking really good songs, you know. Yeah. And um, and that's the battle that songwriters have, you know. Like every guy, Clark had had it, you know, up until the day he died, and I'm sure John Prine. Mm. was thinking, now, yeah, do I have to sing fucking Zabu the Elephant Boy again? <laughs> Is there you know? a song and, that you say, do I have to sing that again tonight? There's not, you know, and, and yeah. as um, uh, 
uh, what's his name, Barry Morgan. I did one of his variety shows and he jokingly said, there's only one thing worse than having a song that you have to play every gig of your life. And that's not having a song. You have to play every gig of your life. And I yeah. thought, yeah, you yeah. bust your guts to get those songs, you know? Yeah. And, and I mean, it's with me, it's only half a dozen of them. You know, it's like Father's Day, Away Away, Beautiful. Step In, Step Out of Tale, I Won't Believe, you know, and, and Monday's Experts. And, and like, you can get through those pretty quickly. And, um, the songs that were, you know, they were written to be played, you know, there's, they're really playable songs, you know, mm. it's not like, especially, you know, Away Away, it's just, I've loved what different musicians bring to that song over the years, you know, so I'm still, I still love playing it, you know, it still has this yeah. real kind of resonance for me and um, I, I know with, um, you even sort of find funny things in it, like, just this time around when, when Brooke Russell joined the band and we, and we started rehearsing and just to sort of changed the band a bit because um, she's a guitarist at playing with anymore. She hasn't played anything else much. And um, so uh, it sort of changed the dynamic in the band that I have to play, not lead guitar, but, you know, I have to play more electric guitar. And, and we went to, to sort of work out the, well, not to work it out, but just to arrange it. And while he started playing the riff, and he, he sort of played it differently to the way it's recorded. And he said, well, look, he said, don't forget, this is, he said, the way he's playing it is the way we wrote it. And it was when we recorded it, we had these producers come in and they changed the riff around and they had back to the original way we wrote that song. Because cause we were really pissed off with the, we had to sack these producers because they were really, you got us into all sorts of strife on that first album, right? Yeah. And, and got us off, you know, really to, got us off on a bad leg, really, in a lot of ways. It took us a few years to, to really correct correct the way we felt about working in the studio mm. and um so wall said yeah let's just play this riff exactly how it was written and i said yeah and and that's so so even after 30 years we're still finding other things in that song you know so it's the thing that occurred to me and it took about 10 years after the wedding's finished is that ultimately all songs become old you know once they're recorded and you've played them a, a, you know, a dozen times, a few tours here and there. They're all old, so all of a sudden it'd be like, well, you know, a song that might have come out on the Dust of My Shoes, the first album after the weddings, can be just as, you know, laborious and uh, really as, you know, a, a song that came out on a weddings album 10 years before that. And yeah. So really they're all your songs and, you might as well, and if they get a reaction and, you know, that's what you started playing music for because you wanted people to love your music and you wanted yeah. that sense of affirmation that you get from playing live. Otherwise, you just stay in your bedroom and play. And that yeah. that putting too fine a point on it, it is playing with music, playing music with other people that really floats yeah. my boat, you know. Yeah. Then I could go into an upper tax bracket if I just played on my own. Well, as I forget who wrote the article, but there was an article that came out sort of halfway through the first lockdown and it said, you know, this could kill the music industry said, but maybe it needed to die. But maybe the, the whole model is wrong, you know, uh, the, with the okay. streaming and the whole thing. It said, maybe this whole thing about saying that musicians, you know, would have to live off their live sound, you know, well, maybe maybe there's something really wrong at, at heart in the way we're, it was structured, you know, and mm. oh, I think it needs to restructuring, you know, and, yeah. and it really does start at the streaming end of things. And, you know, everyone was predicting that that would be the end of the record companies, but it's been the opposite. You know? yeah. Record companies just bought, they just bought into the streaming services. So those big, you know, so like I've been on Mushroom, for, or on Bloodlines, which is Mushroom, which is, Festival, which is Warner's, which is Universal, which is Sony, which is I think Time Warner's, which who own forty nine percent of Spotify. Yeah. So they're not going to lose money. They're, no. they're laughing. Whatever happens, you know. And so you've got the internet's just full up with content that, mm. that by and large, people don't pay for. So, you know, there will be some changes there, but you know, it's like. I don't know about grants. You know, like grants yeah. are kind of the same. People get them all the time. Some people are good, and you, my, my feeling about grants is that, and funding is that it just sets up this little industry which I don't particularly like, and it turns people into you know clerical, like it's. Mm. I just looked around when we were going for funding to 
go to Memphis and, and you just you just get stuck in this clerical stuff. And yeah. and I look at the people who are good at that stuff and who make a, who make their living out of doing it and you go, Well, you know, you were a musician, but now now you're just a and clerk, you know, and you know, the ridiculous thing is the government turned out know, 250 million dollars to live music. All I had to do was wind back some of their cuts to the ABC, yeah. and that would have a blanket effect of helping every musician, right? Just put the music shows back in the ABC, yeah. it shows that Michelle got just take everything that Michelle Guthrie did and just <laughs> wind it back, right? And it would cost a lot less than 250 million. And, and, and offer some incentives to commercial stations for meeting some decent quotas with playing contemporary Australian music. Definitely. So if you said to Triple M, if you can fill a 50% quota or everything over, over 40% or over 30%, every time you go an extra 5%, you get an extra biscuit, you know, at the end of the week. Offer them an incentive. That, yeah. The help that that would give. Look, I know I've had a just via context, via Dave and stuff, I've had some, a few spins on Triple M in the past six months and the, what that has meant in terms of sales, hard. in terms of me getting my old audience back from the weddings days when we were a commercially viable band, it's just massive. Mm. It wipes the floor. With, I, I love community radio. I do, you know, uh, I support it. I've got friends that work in it, all that stuff. But quite often, you know, you're sort of not playing to that many people, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, if, like I say, if the government's offered some sort of incentive for those stations to fill a quota with contemporary Australian music, and by that, I'm, all I mean is music that's been produced in the last 10 years, yep. the industry would just go, whoosh. maybe, how about, how about this? How about a tax break on uh, pressings of under a certain amount? A tax break for independent musicians to set up internet stuff and all that because it's there's you know big taxes on all this stuff you know yeah and not just gst like this you know that i think it's counted as luxury goods or something like that so when you press a record there's x amount of that that you know couple mm -hmm. of grand that you pay to the pressing plant is tax right just get rid of all, all that tax because it earns the government so little money a couple of things like that could absolutely be game changers for the industry and it would help everyone in the industry equally. Yeah. But the problem is with the grant system, it just, I, I hate to say it because I've got, but it's just, you create this whole bureaucracy of uh, arts bureaucracy. All these people get jobs who have never been in a band or never, never run yeah. anything with their own money. So they all get jobs. They all get to, you know, wank off and go to the, <laughs> you know, <laughs> community cup. It just encourages the ABC to have more music on, you know, like, yeah. like uh, uh, something that I've, I've, that's occurred to me during this whole thing, and because we did delivered live, and y you know the people that were running it were just amazed at the figures on the night yeah. that I did, and I said, well, you got to realise that I've got an older crowd; they're all at home, yeah, and they all grew up seeing me on television, and I'm I'm really of the opinion, the more I think of it, that the weddings broke on television not on radio and that was because in those days you had rock around the world um sounds um you know you could get on the steve Weiser show you could get on elmick feast alive and kicking first of all the thing that broke the weddings if you ask me was hey hey it's saturday it's six times now when you went on it you got to do two songs they let us play live every time um and countdown i mean we actually did countdown even yeah you know? so all those things meant that we we had a real visibility to um, the Australian population beyond the inner city. Fans might live in the inner north. And they'll play around the inner north. And they'll go to Triple R. They'll go to PBS and 3CR and do their interviews. And that the signal that might go to Geelong, but really where it goes to is the inner city, you know. And that's who they're playing to. They're playing to their friends in the inner city. But we had this opportunity that got us right out there. And I look at it now and I just go, well, whenever someone like Courtney Barnett or an Australian act starts to break in the States, right? The, the measure by which we use to say that they're doing really well is that they got on the, you know, the Steve, the Ellen DeGeneres show or the, you know, J James Corden show or yeah. Letterman. They got on Letterman. They got on all these shows. And all those shows have music on them. They all have bands and music. What is it wrong with us in Australia that we don't have music on our fucking shows? I don't know. It, even the two the two music shows quiz shows we had didn't have that much music on them. 
you know, Spicks and Spicks, just like I, I did that show and I'm, they played my episode last night. They played it 10 times and I'm mortified because I just sit there like a dickhead, you know, because it's because I was a fish out of water because I wasn't playing. Yep. At least when I did Rockwiz, I get to play a song. And, you know, and that's why Rockwiz is much more based around local musicians because yep. you get to play a song. Um, they get people in the duet. It's set up pretty well. But the fact is, Rockwiz hasn't had a run for, for years now. No. So they've both been off the air. And, you know, we've been trying to sort of get some television for this record. And there's just nothing to be had. Mm. Nothing. And it's, it's what, what is wrong with Australia? That, I don't that, know. There's the new sound. Had, yeah, well, Sundays. that's something. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. Okay. How would you describe your sound in food form? Mm. I'd more describe it as a as an area. I'd just say High Street Northcote because it's just got a lot of different things in it. It's, you've got some, you know, some Japanese, some Chinese, some Mexican, some, you know, and I think that's what it is. It's it's a walk down that street, and I think it does have a fair range of stuff and a range of ideas. So that's how I describe it in terms of food. Uh, food district. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the magazine is called What's My Scene? So what is your scene? Well, at the moment, my scene is my studio, which, you know, <laughs> sort of beam, beams out to the to the world. That's where the last album was put together. But um, yeah. that's, how can I put, that's the exception that proves the rule is that normally it's the opposite. Yeah, my scene is the Merry Creek Tavern and the, the places yeah. I inhabit and the, and the touring yeah, that I do. So, yeah. Well, yeah. I do wish you all the best and congrats yeah, on you. the single um, yeah. and also the B side of the single, my favourite. <laughs> Great. Good on you. It's lovely to hear this. Yeah. <laughs> and I look forward to seeing you guys live really soon. Thank you so yeah, much, Nick. I, I, hope it's, I hope it's soon. I hope it's this year at least. Yeah.